Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Brady Witten, and I welcome you to worship here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge. I welcome those of you joining us at home or wherever you may be, and I welcome those of you who are joining us here in our sanctuary. So today is the sixth Sunday of Easter, and so we continue our celebration of the risen Christ. It is also Mother's Day, and so uh, we need to begin by saying Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers uh, joining us. Uh, today we're going to have a, a wonderful morning of worship. We're going to celebrate a baptism with the Baker family. Look forward to that. And also going to hear a word about how we can learn or what we can learn about joy from Jesus. So I invite you to stand now and to join in our call to worship. Everyone who believes that Jesus is Christ has been born of God. By this we know that we love the children of God. For the love of God is this, and His commandments are not burdensome. And this is the victory that conquers the world. Who is it that conquers the world? This is the one who came by water and blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies. Today's reading is from the Gospel of John. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that you, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in preaching class, uh, preachers are given all kinds of instructions about what makes a good sermon, what makes an effective sermon. And one of the things that uh, we're taught is that everybody should leave with sort of a challenge or an idea of like kind of what what they're supposed to go out and do, kind of where the rubber hits the road and assignments. And so uh, usually that's where you end the sermon, but I'm going to start with your assignment today, and it's this. I need you to be a part of getting word out about a misconception that people have about the Christian life, okay? So I need your help. This is your assignment. I need your help in getting word out about a misconception that people have about the Christian life, and that is this. Some people seem to think the goal of the Christian life is to be miserable for Jesus. Uh, You all know what I'm talking about? I mean, we're we're kind of uh, taught that to be a Christian means that there's this list of do's, and more importantly, there's a list of don'ts, and there's just a bunch of stuff you're not supposed to do, uh, and if you don't do them and you, like, suffer accordingly, then that proves that you love Jesus, right? Uh, There was actually a man I knew at one point in time who told me he was taught this directly. I'd never heard it put quite this directly. He said that anything you do that's fun is a sin, 
right? Anybody? I mean, if any, anything, any, if, 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 if you do it and it brings you a little joy and it brings a smile to your face, it must be a sin. He said he was literally taught this, right? Uh, so uh, some of us, again, are raised with these kind of, uh, these, these lists, right? Uh, no dancing. Have you all seen the movie Footloose? You remember, I'm dating myself. It's this great 80s movie about an entire town that was against what? Dancing. Like Christians shouldn't dance. Uh, how about playing cards? I'll never forget, I was the uh, uh, children's director at a church one time, and I was doing the children's sermon. And I like to do like magic tricks with the cards. So I brought a little deck of cards, and I did a magic trick, and I made some point out of it. Uh, but I, will, I had these Methodist ladies come up and accost me after the worship service. You can't have cards in church. And I was like, yeah, but I was making a point about Jesus with the cards. We weren't gambling. We weren't anyway. But so no cards, uh, no champagne. Right? No, no bubbly stuff. That's a no-no. No listening to the wrong kind of music. I mean, again, there's this whole list, right? And, and it's kind of like this idea that, uh, that if, we, if we can prove how miserable we are for Jesus, that proves how much we love Him. Uh, and so we do things to make ourselves miserable as Christians. We come to worship. <laughs> and we sit for an hour. I love when uh, Sherry said her boys used to look at their watch. Uh, one of my children, who I shall not name, Tasha told me for a long time that every time we stood up and sang a song, he would lean over and say, oh, good, is it over? <laughs> so like literally the opening hymn, he'd be leaning over going, good, is it over? You know, it's like… And seriously, people think, oh, I got to go to worship to show God how much I love Him. Uh, how about reading your Bibles and praying? Got to give up, got to sacrifice my sleep to get up and prove to God how much I love Him. Uh, how about giving away our money? Well, I got to sacrifice some money. In other words, God's not going to… I mean, all these things, we think we do these things to, 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 again, kind of like suffer so that we can prove how much we love God, right? Am I wrong about this? This is, this is a conception that people have about the Christian Christian faith, but it is a conception that I'm, assi give me, I'm giving you this assignment. We need to help people to understand that this is not the truth about who we are. And Jesus makes, to me, this point very clear in this uh, reading from John 15 in verse 11 when He says this, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. I'm saying these things to you. I'm teaching you these things. I'm showing you these things. I'm, I'm trying to teach you about God in such a way that my what? Joy will be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now, how do we take that and turn that into this sour, dour message that so many people ha seem to have about the Christian faith? So, C.S. Lewis says this. I love this quote. Joy is the serious business of heaven. Remember that. Write that one in there. Joy is the serious business of heaven. Um, and so when I was reading about joy this week, I came across several articles that seemed to suggest that joy was a choice that we make. And by the way, I think there's some truth to that. Y'all ever get in kind of a funk about things? You start to look at things, maybe somebody said something or did something, and, and you start to kind of get in this funk. And, and I'll often say to my kids, and I'm, I always also say to myself, like, I, at some point in time, you are choosing to go down that path. You're choosing to look at things negatively. You're choosing to continue down that road. Um, and, 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 it's, and it's a choice that we make. I think there's some truth about that. But I think that joy is much more than just a choice. And again, I think Jesus in this Scripture once again points us to the true source of joy. Listen again. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And in that, Jesus tells us, did you catch it? What is the source of our joy? Did you catch it? Listen again. So that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. He's telling us the source of joy for us as Christians is not necessarily a choice that we make. It's Jesus Himself. It's Jesus' joy. And so what I want to talk about uh, briefly is this. What were the sources of Jesus' joy? Where did Jesus get His joy from? Because I think that that can kind of help us to understand maybe where we're going to get Jesus' joy from. So the first thing is this. I think Jesus' joy came from His connection with God. 
So one of the things the Gospels make abundantly clear is that Jesus had this super intimate connection with God, right? Like Jesus woke up every day and he lived a with God life. And he went through his day in a with God kind of way and he ended his day. I think he probably slept with this intimate connection with God. He actually says here in John in another place, I and the Father are one. I mean, that's about as intimate a connection as you can get, right? Um, But I think a lot of us think, well, that was Jesus' relationship with God, but our relationship can't be like that because we're not Jesus. Jesus is special. Jesus is different. But one thing we need to understand is that Jesus tried to make it clear to his disciples, and I think if he was here today, he'd try to make it clear to us right now, that you and I, too, are called to have this intimate connection with God, right? That's the way, by the way, why we come to worship. It's one of the reasons we come to worship, not to, not to go oh, suffer for God and go sit in those hard pews and put on a tie, right? That's not what it is. Uh, it's because worship is one of the ways that we cultivate this connection and intimacy with God. I say to people, the, the longer I've been involved in, in Christian worship and the longer it's been a regular practice and discipline in my life, like something shifts inside of me during worship. I, in some ways, I like return to being a sane person, <laughs> and then I go from there, right? And we come back next week. But, but worship helps me to maintain that connection with God. Do you all experience that? It, it just it helps to create that intimacy. This is why we read the Scriptures. This is why we pray. This is why we engage in these practices. Not to, again, not to suffer, <laughs> but to, uh, to kind of abide in Christ. He uses that language. Uh, it's a way of maintaining this intimate, intimate connection. Um, I think the second thing that was a source of Jesus' joy was his collaboration with God. Now, I'm using an old Baptist trick here. You're going to get three C's. This is supposed to help you to remember. So, connection. Second one is collaboration, right? So, uh, Jesus very clearly understood that his purpose on the earth was to reveal God's love to the world and to secure humanity's salvation by giving his life on the cross. Like, you just see that clear purpose throughout his life. He understood that he kind of was on a mission from God. Uh, and, and because of that mission, he had a clear sense of purpose, had a clear sense of direction, and I think that that collaboration of knowing that he was here to do the work of God gave him, a, was a source of joy for him. So, one of my favorite TV shows uh, is Undercover Boss. It, it's, not, it's not on anymore, but I watch it in reruns. So, Undercover Boss. Any Undercover Boss fans out there? So, one of my favorite ones was the CEO of Waste Management. Uh, came, uh, you know, did you know the show, what they do in the Undercover Boss? Kind of like the CEO or the president of the company comes and he works at these different jobs within the company. So, the CEO of Waste Management was doing work, working in his his company for a couple of days. You all know waste management. They're the like trash collection people. Uh, They also apparently have a little side thing where they do porta potties. So they have waste management porta potties. So the the president works for a couple of days on one of the dump trucks collecting, uh, you know, just from dumpsters and stuff like that. But then he spends a day on one of those porta potty clean out trucks. What do they call those things? Honey dippers or something? Isn't there some term for them, you know, with the big vacuum cleaner, they go in and suck on, you know. Anyway. So he's riding on one of these trucks, and as you're watching this kind of unfold, the driver of the truck, whose name is Michael, is one of the most strangely happy people that you have ever encountered in your life. He's just, he's just got this, like, he's just glowing. He's just happy. He's got, and uh, did I remind you what Michael's doing for a living? He's driving the, we clean out the porta potties truck. So he's driving this, and of course, watching it, you're going, why is this guy so happy? And I think everybody watching the show must have been thinking this because at some point in time, the CEO of the company looks over at this guy and goes, Michael, you drive a porta potty cleanup truck, but you are one of the happiest people that I have ever met in my life. And uh, we come to find out that Michael is a person of faith. And he says to himself, he says, here's the way I think about this. What is one of the worst experiences that a human being can have? going into a dirty porta potty right? I mean, it's, it's, it's just awful, right? Go, going into a, a, just a really… He says, I am the one who gets to make sure that does not happen. 
And he, so he, had, he got up every day and he kind of saw his duty and his work. He can make the world a little happier, a little brighter by making sure that those porta potties were clean. And I'm telling you, the, the dude was not faking it. He is just, it's just like glowing with joy and happiness, right? And I think it's because he found a way to understand how his life and his work was co-laboring with God and collaborating and bringing a little joy and bringing a little light and bringing a little happiness into the world, right? And I guess what I want to ask you is, do you have that sense about your life and about your work, that you are co-laboring with God, you're collaborating with God, wherever it may be. Maybe it's in, the, in your home, the way you're raising your children. Maybe it's uh, uh, at your workplace, in school, whatever it is, do you understand that your place in the world is to be a person who labors with God? And I think if we do that, that there's a little joy that comes out <laughs> no matter what we're doing. Uh, the final thing is this. I think Jesus' joy came from His confidence in God. Okay, so what's the first one? Connection, collaboration or co-laboring, and then the last one, confidence. So the more I spend time with the Jesus story, the more amazed I am at the deep trust and faith that Jesus had in God. I don't know why it amazes me. It's kind of the whole point, right? But I mean, it, just, it astonishes me, the things that Jesus went through and the things that He suffered. Uh, but no matter what He went through and no matter what He suffered, He still believed uh, in the goodness of God and He still believed that God was with Him and that things were somehow going to work out. Uh, even in the face of death, and I think that's the most important thing, even in the face of death, Jesus' confidence in God went beyond even the circumstances of this life that we know. He says, I trust God in life, in death, and even in life beyond death. Uh, he told his disciples over and over again, the Son of Man will undergo great suffering. He will be turned over to the authorities and die. He knew this. But I've told you all this before. Go look this up in the Gospels. Every time he tells them about his coming death, he adds to it at the end. And what does he say? But on the third day, I will rise again. That's the kind of confidence that he had. Uh, and by the way, Easter people, he was right. He was right. Paul echoes this kind of faith in one of the most famous scriptures, I think, of all of Scripture in Romans 8, where he says, I am convinced that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing, not even death. And I think Jesus invites you and I into that kind of confidence. Do you have that kind of confidence in God that looks even beyond the painful and difficult circumstances of this life and says, you know what, I still believe that God is good, I still believe God is with me, and I still believe that things are going to work out in the end. So again, I think a lot of Christians get this wrong. They just get it wrong. Uh, that They think that you know, Christianity is about being miserable for Jesus somehow. Uh, the truth is, Jesus tells us one of the major points of His teaching is that his joy may be in us and that our joy may be complete. Um, so, will you all accept the assignment? Let's, let's turn this misconception around and help people to know that the Christian life is a life of joy, right? So, several weeks ago, I ran across a poem by a 14th century uh, poet named Hafez, and, I, and it's about joy, and I wanted to leave you with these words. I sometimes forget that I was created for joy. My mind is too busy, my heart too heavy for me to remember that I have been called to dance the sacred dance of life. I was created to smile, to love, to be lifted up and to lift up others. O oh, sacred one, untangle my feet from all that ensnares. Free my soul that we might dance and that our dancing might be contagious. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.